What's going on, smart people? It's been a while, but it is finally tensor time again, and I'm in a different setting now. Uh, in the last video, which is probably like six months old at this point, we defined the covariant derivative. We noticed that if you take the derivative of a tensor, the end result, in general, doesn't transform as a tensor anymore. But if we add to it this additional linear transformation on the vector, where these transformation coefficients are the affine connection coefficients, the combination of the two does transform as a tensor. So we modified our definition of the derivative to be the covariant derivative. And in doing so, now we're guaranteed that when we take covariant derivatives of tensors, the end result will still be a tensor. That's where we left off. Uh, and as it stands, this still isn't the most useful. This is great. We know that it transforms as a tensor, that, so tensor calc is saved. Uh, but we still don't know what these coefficients are. We just know how they transform. But we still have to know what they are on one basis to be able to say what they are in a different, you know what I'm saying? The only thing we've really imposed as of yet, and if you look in Wald's book, there's a bunch of little things that we've also been imposing implicitly along the way. But all we've really been uh, focusing on is the fact that there's no torsion. We're imposing that there's no torsion, which means that this set of connection coefficients is symmetric under the exchange of the bottom two indices. If we swap alpha and beta, these coefficients are the same. That's the no torsion rule. Um, and that narrows it down from infinitely many sets of connection coefficients to probably still infinitely many. So the goal for today is to impose one more requirement that will narrow that down to one unique set of connection coefficients that we're going to call the Christoffel symbols. Okay. And the requirement that we're going to impose, I'm going to erase this because today we're not going to be taking covariant derivatives of vectors. We're going to be taking covariant derivatives of second rank tensors. And the rule is a little bit different for that. You see, for every index that you take the covariant derivative, or that the object you're taking the covariant derivative has, you have one additional term of these connection coefficients. And it carries a positive sign if the index is upstairs, if it's contravariant, and it carries a minus sign if it's downstairs. So we're going to be taking the covariant derivative of a second rank tensor, namely the metric tensor. And to do that, it goes as follows. The covariant derivative, I'm gonna use alpha, of some tensor, t mu nu, is equal to that partial derivative still, partial alpha, t mu nu. Since these are both downstairs, it's going to carry a minus sign with the connection coefficients, and we're going to be transforming each of the indices. So that's why there's two terms. So it's going to be minus gamma. We're going to just sum over the top index. I'll call that rho. And we're going to have an alpha that survives. And then we're going to interchange these mu and nu's for each term. T rho nu. And then the next one, we're just going to swap this mu and nu. Minus gamma rho alpha nu t rho and mu. Great. So this is how we take the covariant derivative of a second rank doubly covariant tensor. If these were upstairs, then both of these would be positive. If one was upstairs, one was downstairs, one would be positive, one would be negative. You get it. The additional constraint that we're going to impose that'll allow us to uniquely solve for these connection coefficients is known as metric compatibility. So write that up here, metric compatibility. And what that means is that the covariant derivative of the metric, g mu nu, be equal to zero. Why should it be equal to zero? Well, in some sense, it's a choice. But the way that I like to think about it is locally, you think of the metric in terms of the dot products of the basis vectors. So what we have is we have a derivative of a dot product, a derivative of a scalar product. So it's just saying that when we parallel transport the basis vectors, the dot product is left unchanged. OK. Um, so this is something that we're going to impose. And we're going to do it three times. We're going to look at three permutations of this condition, and they're all going to be equal to zero. So we have, what do we have? Alpha, mu, nu. The hardest part of this whole thing is just keeping track of the indices, but this is like episode 13 of the tensor calculus series, so I assume that's, that's always the hard part. Okay, so for the first one, we're going to look at, let's write it up here, alpha, mu, nu. We're going to look at mu, nu, alpha, and uh, nu, alpha, mu. 
So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be writing down the definition of the covariant derivative of the metric three times, and then we're going to subtract those from each other since they're all equal to zero anyways. So for the first one, we're, just, we're always just going to be using this definition, but we're going to swap uh, our indices around for each term, and we're going to switch this t mu nu to a g mu nu. So we have the partial derivative. Let's go ahead and already set this equal to zero, so we have the, just so it's in our mind. We have the partial derivative with respect to alpha of g mu nu, that's the easy part, minus, now we need the connection coefficients, we need to contract with the upper index since uh, the metric is doubly covariant, so we need to sum over the top index, so we'll row here. The first index always survives in the connection coefficient, so it's going to have an alpha, and then we're going to have two terms, one that has a mu here, one that has a nu here. Mu g summing over rho and nu minus gamma rho alpha nu g rho mu. Okay, that's the first term. Let's do this two more times. So we have zero is equal to the partial with respect to mu. This is where it gets tricky for me just because I've already written it down once so any other order just sounds like I'm doing it wrong in my head. Uh, g nu alpha minus gamma, we keep this rho the mu should always survive now, and then we're going to have a new g rho alpha minus gamma rho. Mu always survives alpha g rho nu. I'm getting better at this. Zero equal to d nu g alpha mu minus g gamma rho nu survives. So we'll have an alpha g rho mu minus rho nu uh, mu g rho alpha. There we go. Congratulations, we've written the same thing three times. Now what we're going to do, I'm going to call this equation 1, this equation 2, and this equation 3. And we're going to take 1 minus 2 minus 3. This is the conventional way of coming up with these Christoffel symbols. I don't know how they figured out to take these orders of uh, indices. The book does it a little bit different. Actually, they define it twice in the book uh, in different chapters. Um, but it all amounts to the same thing. But this is how I learned it, so this is how I'm teaching it. So we take this difference of equations. Uh, the derivatives will always survive. So let's go ahead and just write those out real quick. Um, and I'm going to partition this up a little bit just to make things a bit more, a bit less cluttered. And I suppose let's do it down here, just because this is going to be a bit lengthy, I think. So we have these partial derivatives. I'm just going to be rewriting those. Alpha g mu nu minus d mu g nu alpha minus d nu g alpha mu. And then we're going to be subtracting all of these connection coefficients terms. Um, but the reason we do this is because there's going to be a lot of cancellations. So here we have a minus alpha mu. Here we have a minus mu alpha. So if we take this minus this, remember that this is symmetric about the bottom two indices. So this is the same as minus alpha mu instead. Then these terms cancel when we take this minus this. The minus sign flips and we add it to it. So this term cancels. Okay. Uh, but not only that, we have a minus, let's see, a minus alpha nu. And then we have a minus nu alpha. Same thing happens. We have minus, minus, minus. So these cancel as well. Okay. So we have four cancellations out of the six terms that contain the connection coefficients. Okay, and we're doing minus 2 minus 3. So this term gets multiplied by a minus 1. So we have a mu nu plus, because it's minus, plus a nu mu, but these can be permuted as well. So this will just give us an extra factor of 2 times this. Okay, so this is going to be a plus 2 gamma rho mu nu g rho alpha. 
So just the fact that I've, I've swapped these indices, this already gets multiplied by a minus one here, and we get minus minus, so it just becomes a two. Okay, and this should be equal to zero. Fantastic. Now we're gonna start solving for this gamma. It's not gonna be too hard. All we're gonna have to do is recall our buddy old pal, the inverse metric, but let's go ahead and just get this stuff over on one side in the factor of two while we're at it. So we have gamma rho mu nu g rho alpha is equal to one half. And then we're moving this over so these two negatives become a positive, so we get a d mu g nu alpha plus d nu g alpha mu minus this guy d alpha g nu nu. But we want to get this by itself, so we're going to impose a relation that we learned about when we defined the inverse metric which is that, so what do we have? Uh, rho alpha, we're summing over rho, so in order to get a Kronecker delta out of this, I'm gonna have to contract it with an inverse metric that has an alpha in there. So we can use g, let's call it lambda alpha, g rho alpha is equal to, I'm gonna give myself a little bit of space, is equal to delta lambda rho. Okay. So these are, these are matrix elements, these are, these are numbers. So the numbers commute with the connection coefficients, which is why I'm, when I multiply by the inverse metric, I can move it past this connection coefficient. Plus it's not being contracted with this guy yet. Well, yeah, no, it's not because it doesn't carry any mutual indices. Um, so when we multiply this by the connection coefficient, rho mu nu, all this does, rho mu nu, is it changes this rho to a lambda. Lambda mu nu. Okay, so multiplying both sides by the inverse metric, we get our expression for the connection coefficients. Gamma lambda mu nu is equal to one half g uh, lambda alpha d mu g nu alpha plus d nu g alpha mu minus d alpha g mu nu. There we have what are defined as the Christoffel symbols. I'm not going to try to spell Christoffel or symbols. No. Um, this is called the Christoffel symbols of the second kind. If we lower the lambda index, then it's called the Christoffel symbols of the first kind for some reason. I don't quite understand that, but it is what it is. So now we've uniquely defined the connection coefficients in terms of the metric. So one thing, in, in a sense we're done, this video is done. In the next video, what we're, what we're going to be talking about is more complex differential operations acting on tensors namely divergence, curl, Laplacians. Now that we know how to ca uh, actually calculate these coefficients, if we know what the metric is. Just a couple more comments before we wrap it up. When people learn about Christoffel symbols, oftentimes the first thing that you start associating Christoffel symbols with are curvatures of space, because you have this you, the derivatives of metrics and stuff like that. Uh, but that's not really the right way to be thinking about this. We will, in a couple videos, develop a, a formalism for determining whether or not the space that we're working in is curved or not when we talk about the Riemann curvature tensor. But non-zero Christoffel symbols does not necessarily mean that your space is curved. Now, if we're working in a, just a, forget about time, just, just a Cartesian basis in, you know, flat space, then we know that our metric, where'd my chalk go? We know that our metric, g mu nu, is just a diagonal of ones, right? In, in Cartesian coordinates in flat space, this is our metric. So when we take derivatives of the metric, we get zero every single time. Um, so you might say, oh, flat space, the Christoffel symbols are zero. But if we are in, say, spherical coordinates, where we have an R squared here now, and an R squared sine, sine theta, I always forget if it's squared or not. 
Um, now we're taking derivatives with respect to r with respect to theta of this guy here. So the Christoffel symbols actually won't be zero, even though the geometry of the space hasn't changed at all, only the basis that we're describing it in has. And the reason for this, and this is an appropriate way of interpreting the Christoffel symbols in flat space, but you have to be more careful when we actually do start dealing with curvature, is when we take derivatives of vectors, we have coefficients attached to basis vectors. Right? And those coefficients might change depending on where we're looking at in space, but also the basis vectors might change. And that's what's characterized by these connection coefficients. If I have, say, something on the surface of a circle, and I have my polar coordinates where I have my basis vector here, my r hat, and I have uh, my theta hat, or let's just make them not normalized. In GR, you typically don't have the normalized basis vectors. These basis vectors change depending on where along the circle I'm at. So in a Cartesian coordinate system, when I take these derivatives or when I measure these points at different, or these vectors at different points, the basis vectors themselves don't start pointing in different directions, but in polar coordinates they do. So that's what's being uh, captured in, in, in a flat space by these Christoffel symbols. That's also why when you look in Griffiths or when you start dealing with divergence, curl, Laplacians, and these different coordinate systems, you can't just take derivatives with respect to the coordinates. You have these additional factors, and these additional factors are actually contained in these Christoffel symbols. But we'll be getting to that in the next video. Next video, we'll talk about divergence, curl, and Laplacian, or the covariant generalizations of those in terms of covariant derivatives. And then in the following video, we are, I, I haven't thought about it yet, but I imagine we'll start commuting covariant derivatives. We'll define the Riemann curvature tensor, I hope. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video, learned something. Uh, let me know in the comments section if you did, and I'll see you guys there.